Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. My name's Sally Warhaft, and it is a great pleasure tonight to welcome back the Lowy Institute for our, well, I think we can call it an annual special. Uh, this time last year, uh, we, we got the Lowy Institute down to, well, discuss what might be ahead in the year of foreign affairs and foreign policy from an Australian perspective. And back then, of course, Julia Gillard was Prime Minister and Bob Carr was the Foreign Minister. And China really dominated a lot of our conversation. It's remarkable to think how much has happened in that 12 months. Of course, we've got a new government, a new prime minister, a new foreign minister. Kevin Rudd is lending a helping hand in the Ukraine. So <laughs> he's still busy, but uh, the world, of course, has new problems and it's got some old ones, and it's got some other ones that have sort of been in hibernation. So tonight, we're gonna get our three uh, expert guests here to uh, try and tell us what might be happening in the 12 months to come and what the government perhaps should be focusing on and what they might be focusing on. Joining us, Rory Metcalf is the director of the International Security Program at Lowy. He's worked as a diplomat, a journalist, an intelligent analyst, various postings and positions in New Delhi, Japan, Bougainville, Canberra. He's a senior research fellow in Indian Strategic Affairs at the University of New South Wales, a fellow at the Australia India Institute, and a non-resident senior fellow with the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. He's also worked as a senior strategic analyst with the Office of National Assessment, our peak intelligence agency. I should also tell you that with all three of these, I've culled their CVs so much, so I'm giving you a highlight package. Jenny Hayward-Jones is the director of the Maya Foundation Melanesia program at Lowy. She's worked for more than a decade in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, serving in the Australian missions in Vanuatu and Turkey. And uh, her research interests focus uh, on policy in the Pacific Islands region and political and social change in Melanesia. She's also worked in the Solomon Islands and has produced several policy papers on Fiji. Anthony Bubalo is the research director at the Lowy Institute and uh, director also of the West Asia program covering the Middle East, Central and Southwest Asia. He's written extensively for publications in Australia and abroad, as have all our guests, and is the co-editor with Michael Fullylove of this new book, Reports from a Turbulent Decade. It's a Lowy Institute extravaganza, Australia's brightest thinkers on the world's biggest issues, and uh, it really is all of that, and I think you'll be able to get it after the conversation tonight. You can get a signed copy. Uh, Anthony, uh, before joining Lowy, was an officer in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He served in the Australian diplomatic mission in Saudi Arabia and Israel. He has just got back from a visit uh, to the Middle East, which uh, we'll be hearing something about. It's uh, welcome, the three of you. Please Thanks. give them a very warm yeah. welcome. Thank you. It's 12 months since uh, we last met, and I just outlined some of the sort of the, the, the well, it's changed, things have changed. Mm. So I want to start by asking the three of you to broadly sketch out from each of your perspectives where you think. Australia is right now um, in its relationship with the rest of the world and what the, the coming year might have in store. I might start with you, Rory. Look, thanks, uh, thanks, Sally. It's great to be back here and um, thanks for that uh, I guess hum humbling introduction. Um, a year ago, as you said, we were quite focused on China and I have to say that much hasn't changed. 
But if I were to look at the, the past 12 months and the way our region and our place in the world has changed, I think there has been quite a lot of, of so sobering news, uh, quite a lot of troubling news, and I think, if anything, the challenges are even greater than they were a year ago for Australia's foreign policy, for our strategic policy, for our relative power and wealth uh, in, the, in the region, our, our security broadly defined. China's still, I think, very much front and centre of that, uh, although the news headlines are very much about Ukraine and Crimea and the other side of the world at the moment. Uh, the the big, big problems that I've focused on recently uh, have been concentrated on the, uh, the China-Japan relationship, uh, the fact that Australia is coming under, I think, I think, quite intense pressure from both China and Japan to really take their sides in, uh, in their disputes over uh, over islands, over history and so forth. And we shouldn't pretend that this is just some kind of luxury, some kind of extravagance. These two powerful countries are quite serious uh, about essentially contesting uh, leadership in North Asia and, and contesting their own positions in the world. And Australia is a lot closer now to the, the centre of the action economically and strategically than we were. Uh, the fact that uh, a month ago, for example, uh, a Chinese a naval exercise came uh, quite close to Australian territory for the first time uh, ever, really, uh, it was a, a bit of a wake-up call for our, our defence planners. Now, I'm not saying that uh, things are especially dire for Australia at the moment, but uh, if we don't get our own house in order you know, in the next few years, uh, our economy, our foreign policy, our military, if we don't really uh, add a bit more weight and uh, really make some very rational, stable uh, decisions, I think we're going to be in for quite a, a, a troubling run. Uh, in, in a way, the future uh, is already here in Asia. And with that, history has come back in, in quite a nasty way. So I, I do think that China, uh, especially Japan more than we realise, these big powers in Asia are going to confront us with some, some difficult decisions. And just to, to end that introduction, uh, our relations with Indonesia have probably been as good as they're going to be uh, in the last few years, and it's going to be very hard to get those back on track uh, after all the problems we've had recently. Jenny. Well, I'll talk about my patch, which is the Pacific Islands region, and I think we certainly have seen huge changes in the last few years. We've seen uh, Papua New Guinea um, really grow its economy enormously, um, courtesy mainly of a huge investment from ExxonMobil in liquefied natural gas. Um, we'll see that come on stream next year. Um, probably the end of this year, actually. Um, we've seen Fiji, which has been isolated from the region um, since the coup in 2006, become more important internationally. It's sought its own foreign relations with many of the emerging economies itself. It's now the chair of the G77 um, that has strong ties and influence in the non-aligned movement, um, which Australia tends not to take very seriously, but is very important in the developing world. Um, we've seen incredibly strong economic growth in all the Melanesian countries, so I think um, one of the big features about this region is we've really seen a rise in the independence um, of particularly Melanesian countries, not so much the Polynesian and Micronesian, which are a bit more aid-dependent, um, but certainly the Melanesian countries have become more independent in the way they pursue their, their foreign policy interests and less um, interested in follow, following Australia's lead um, in the region. We've also seen uh, more options in the region. We've seen the rise of Chinese economic influence. Um, we've seen a lot more Asian countries start to be interested in investing in Papua New Guinea, a little bit in Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu. Um, we're seeing a rise in tourism from China as well into the region. So there's just there's a lot more going on in the region. It's no longer an Australian lake. Um, it's no longer a region where Australia and New Zealand can tell countries what to do and expect that they'll follow our lead um, in the United Nations and elsewhere. Um, and it's no longer a, a region where countries are, are dependent on Australian largesse. There, there is a, a lot more investment going on from Australia and elsewhere, even from Europe. Um, so certainly Pacific Island countries have a lot more choice um, these days, and that really is changing the way Australia looks at its influence in the region. Anthony. So the Middle East, not much happening there. <laughs> um, we're at a really interesting point um, in terms of particularly um, the West's engagement in the Middle East and the US, but also Australia's engagement in the Middle East, in that you know, for just over a decade now, um, we've been deeply engaged in the region, um, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. You know, literally, we've had our fingers through the entrails of the place. Um, and that's produced this overwhelming desire to get out. 
uh, and, and you've, you've, you know, you've seen that in, in the way that Obama is trying to recalibrate American policy in the region. Even in an Australian case, even given the minor role we play there, kind of a desire to kind of end our involvement, we've pulled most of our troops out of Afghanistan, we've pulled our troops out of Iraq a long time ago, so we're trying to get out. The problem is the region is not going to let us get out because um, at the end of that time when we're most weary of the region, the region is going through its biggest period of turmoil really in its modern history. You've just got back. Tell us a bit yeah. about that, that trip. Um, so it was, it was a couple of weeks um, in Egypt, Jordan and in Israel. And, um, you know, I look, as a professional Middle East watcher, um, you know, bleak is, bleak is something you get used to. <laughs> but I have to say it was bleaker than even I thought. And what's particularly worrisome for me is Egypt. Um, there's a lot of focus today on Syria, and there should be. Um, there's a, it's a humanitarian disaster of you know, calamitous biblical proportions. I mean, over 100,000 people dead, 2.5 million refugees. You know, while we're in Jordan, um, visited Zatari refugee camp, which is now the second largest refugee camp in the world. But, but Egypt, which gets less attention in many ways, is, is as disturbing for me because we are now, I think, on the threshold of a serious, prolonged period of instability in Egypt. Egypt is, is in many, arguably the region's most important country. It's the wellspring of a lot of the region's ideas, including you know, Islamist and jihadist ideas. Um, basically, what you have there is um, a period of turmoil that emerged after the overthrow of the Mubarak regime that saw the main Islamist opposition, the Muslim Brotherhood, come to power. Um, they, uh, they had uh, a, their candidate win a free and fair election, and then last July um, he was deposed from power in a military coup. And so you have the military now and the Muslim Brotherhood squaring off. And the military think that they're going to, they're going to wipe the Brotherhood out. The, the Brotherhood think that the people are going to rise, rise up and put them back in power. Neither of these things are going to happen. And what that creates is a very hot atmosphere that is being exploited by extremists, but are also kind of radicalising a lot of uh, young people. So while Syria gets a lot of the attention, quite rightly, what worries me is, is the direction of Egypt. And then when you combine that with what else is happening in the region, the kind of the, the general sense of economic malaise, the fact that you know, borders are, are dropping in places and you're seeing, for example, in the Libyan case, the free flow of arms from looted Libyan armories that are finding their way to Egypt, but also as far as Syria, all that um, produces a, a very, very worrying picture. Let's come back home and we'll, we'll radiate out a bit with, with all of that. But um, we'll start with the new um, government and foreign minister and how they're tracking and how Julie Bishop's tracking. Perhaps, Jenny, we'll start with you and Julie Bishop's approach to the region because she's got a particular interest, it seems, um, in the Solomon Islands. Uh, but also the the relationship with Papua New Guinea, if you can talk about how you think that is going. Yes, well, it's a very exciting time for our specific watchers, of which there are not that many in Australia, to finally have a foreign minister who comes to office saying that uh, the Pacific is a very high priority for her and spent much of her time in opposition saying it was her highest priority and continues to say Papua New Guinea is um, you know, very close to her heart. Um, she gave a speech at the Lowy Institute last year in which she held up a photo of a pen pal that she had um, as a youngster in, in Papua New Guinea. So she has, and her sister, I think, taught in PNG. So she has some, some family connections. She has visited the country many times in opposition. So um, she has a genuine interest um, in the place and a genuine interest in, in the wider Pacific. Um, she also came to office promising to normalise relations with Fiji, which is a marked change from the previous government and even from the hmm. previous Conservative government um, under Alexander Downer's leadership as foreign minister. So we're really seeing quite dramatic change, um, at least in, in the approach. Um, we're yet to see, I guess, what that will mean over the longer term. She's certainly... Um, putting, I guess, some money where her, her mouth is for the moment and uh, continuing to commit to um, certainly aid in, in the region um, and announcing new projects and um, emphasising that we do want to move away from a relationship that is solely focused on aid to one that's based on, on equal partnership and recognises the significant Australian investment and people-to-people -people relationships that we have with many Pacific Island countries. Um, she has a particular focus on 
on Papua New Guinea um, and Melanesia and has an interest in, she says she wants to leave a legacy um, where Pacific Islands, island countries um, love Australia again, really, um, and you know, want to make Australia their number one partner um, where they have lost that. Um, there is a lot of talk in the region about China overtaking Australia um, as the, the partner of choice, um, as Ms. Bishop, Ms. Bishop describes it. Um, now, I did some research last year which showed that China was nowhere near taking over Australia, in, um, certainly in economic terms or in aid terms or tourism terms or anything like that. Um, but th there is a perception that China is out there. They're investing heavily in, in PNG, and um, certainly that, that's a, it's a policy reality that Australia is responding to. Um, so I think we're going to see this government, uh, certainly under Julie Bishop, continue to, to focus on the region. Um, it's good news that she's doing that. I think you know, she's got a, certainly a big agenda, so it's going to be hard to, to keep that focus, but she has a very genuine interest, which I think will endure. I was with her in Papua New Guinea a few weeks ago, um, and she was certainly had a very good relationship with the government there. Um, I attended a lunch that she did with a number of high-profile women in PNG, and it really was inspiring to see the way that she reacted with women and, and listened and, and was really really at one with, with them. Um, very encouraging. And I think um, we should not underestimate the value that a female foreign minister offers to Australian policy, certainly in the region, in a region where uh, women's representation in parliament as a whole region is less than 5%. It's the worst in the world. Oh, what, worse than us? So. <laughs> Indeed, if I can be believed. Bishop um, even started this lunch she had with uh, PNG women by saying that she was the only woman in cabinet um, and therefore <laughs> had proved herself that you know it was it was possible to to climb over some barriers and and get places and I, you know I think that's a a real benefit that she brings to the role that um, previous foreign ministers have not been able to do um, because women, uh, violence against women and um, the role of women in Pacific society is a really big issue um, and I think she can do a lot to help them. Rory, uh, let's switch it now a bit further to, to Indonesia but perhaps include Manus Island too in the, the what perhaps the headlines are focused on. Manus Island's in the Pacific. I know, no, no, I, I know. I just want to bring you... I do know that. I, I want to bring you into it about uh, what, what Jenny's given us is a... I think something we don't hear and, yeah. and read about so much in the news, what we've heard about is um, problems, obviously, in, in Manus Island and a, a, a sense uh, of diplomatic challenges, to say the very least, with Indonesia. So what's your take on how the new minister and government are, are tracking? Look, I think, let me look at Indonesia and let me look at some of the other big Asian, Asian powers as well. Um, I think the, uh, and I'll leave Jenny to the specifics of PNG, um, <laughs> but seriously, I think uh, that there's, there's no question this government has had uh, a rocky start. It's had some real problems uh, in its early months in major foreign relationships. And I'd have to add China as well uh, to Indonesia, of course. Now, to be fair, uh, these problems generally weren't of the government's own making. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the spy uh, issue, the espionage uh, sort of controversy with Indonesia, which has obviously done serious damage to the relationship, uh, is something that the government essentially inherited. Uh, and of course, uh, it is, I guess, ironic in a way that the government has been having to manage uh, decisions made by previous Australian governments, Labor governments, and indeed uh, the alliance relationship with the United States and has really had to, to wear that at the same time as the whole uh, problem with Indonesia over people smuggling, stop the boats and, and, and so forth. Now there's no question that uh, Australia-Indonesia relations have hit, have hit a very low patch and it's happened on this government's watch, uh, but I wouldn't uh, I certainly wouldn't um, lay the blame at the foreign minister's door for that. I think she's um, she's done a, a reasonably good job of, of managing that issue. The um, the bigger challenge for her, I think, has actually been with China. Mm. And the um, I hate to drag you back to North Asia, but I think the um, the situation with China, the pressure she's come under, and we've come under from China to take their side against. Japan, um, the degree to which the Chinese were uh, unsettled by some of the language uh, that she and the government used about the China-Japan maritime dispute, 
to me, that's a bigger issue for Australia's long-term security. And I think, I, I think we've gotten through that. I mean, the fact that China has now signalled that it does still want to pursue a free trade agreement with Australia, uh, or con conclude it, I'm sorry, in the near future, um, is a... Uh, welcome and pragmatic step by the Chinese, but I do think that sometime in the next few months the government's going to have to send out a very clear signal about where it wants to take the relationship with China in the wider Asian or Indo-Pacific context. And I think, uh, for example, a major statement or speech by the government that puts out a, a positive agenda, with self-respect for Australia, for managing relations with China is, is going to be necessary. So I'd, I'd, I'd watch for that. I'll get you in one moment, uh, Anthony, but just back to Manus Island, because I Make think... Make him answer the question. A, yeah, I think, um, uh, I mean, there's obviously been some short-term really yeah. big problems there, including the very violent death yeah. of somebody um, <clears throat> recently, but there are long-term uh, really troubling questions in that policy. Uh, how, how is that panning out? It's a really difficult question to answer um, because there's so many unknowns about whether it will indeed, the policy will indeed stop the boats, how, how long it will go on for. Um, obviously, it's intended to send a very clear message to people smugglers and would-be asylum seekers that you should not try to get on a boat and you should not try to come to Australia because this is where you will end up. And I'm sure the government is hoping that it is a temporary thing and that um, it will indeed stop the boats and we'll have a, a finite number of people in the um, detention centres in Manus and, and Nauru, but I think we have Australia as a nation and Australia as a, a government has underestimated the impact and effect this policy is having on Papua New Guinea, um, in particular the people of Manus Island, and on Nauru itself, which is a tiny country um, with very severe resource constraints, um, basically doing the Australian government's bidding so that it can maintain this centre and uh, run its economy, because its economy really is dependent on um, external projects like this. Um, on Manus, which is uh, a remote island in, in PNG, and I think that's one of the reasons it was selected as the <laughs> venue for the detention centre. I mean, there are a number of locations uh, the PNG government could have chosen, but all of, all of the others probably have their own problems, so Manus is probably Manus really is problematic. relatively better off, isn't it, than a lot of It, it is relatively better off, um, partly because it's remote um, and it doesn't have the, the kind of violence that we've seen in um, other places in PNG which have resources projects which do tend to drive um, some of the violence because they create uh, inequalities and jealousies um, and... Um, the Highlands, for example, the Highlands region itself has a, a long sort of tribal history and culture which has its own uh, violent tendencies and we don't, we don't see that in Manus. Manus traditionally has a, um, a very strong um, emphasis on education, so a, a lot of people from Manus tend to be very highly placed in the public sector and private sector in PNG, so um, quite influential. Um, so Manus... Yes, it's true, it has a lot less problems than the rest of PNG, but it is still a very poor, underdeveloped uh, place and um, has resource constraints of its own and employment problems of its own. Um, so putting a centre in a place which, which has those, those issues and, and which really needs to sort of resolve its own uh, place in PNG and its relationship with the central government is now being put under an almost strain um, through this policy of the Australian government. Now, you know, there may be some economic benefits for, for companies in Manus, but we, we haven't seen them flow through in a big way yet, and that, that is causing some resentment as well. So there are, there are all sorts of problems with this. The, the PNG government is also going slow on the uh, processing side, um, whether through lack of capacity or deliberate intent. I, I, suggest, I think it would be the former rather than the latter. Um, but there's also a lot of local resentment towards the idea that they might eventually, the PNG government might eventually resettle asylum seekers who are found to be refugees. Um, and Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has ignored those to date, but I think those voices will only increase in number, um, particularly if those, um, those refugees are, are then supported by Australia, which is actually a part of the agreement that they are, you know, have access to, to welfare entitlements that they would in Australia. Um, so we're so perhaps creating a... I don't want to use the, the A word, but, but perhaps creating a, a system of division in PNG where um, refugees are seen to have access to housing, um, education and uh, health services that local Papua New Guineans don't have themselves. Um, 
Anthony, well, I, I read the speech that Julie Bishop gave very a couple of weeks into her um, new role at Lowy, and the list of countries she'd already been to mm. was just mind-boggling. <clears throat> While her, the minister and the government are dealing with all the things you've both just described, We've also got the seat on the Security Council mm -hmm. of the United Nations, um, the Middle East, um, relationships with America at that bigger level. Yep. How is it going? Well, I mean, there are different things there. I mean, obviously, in, in terms of the Middle East, um, I think the, the general approach was, as a part of what I described earlier, the desire to, OK, there was that era, we want to kind of pull back from that now. Now, there's one big wrinkle in that at the moment, and it's the one that's preoccupying a lot of the time of the kind of intelligence agency, the security agencies, and that's Syria, where you have now... You know, between 100 and 200 Australians, by conservative estimate, um, participating in some way in in the fighting. Now, not all of them will be, you know, in frontline kind of combat. Some of them will be playing support roles. Um, um, some smaller number will be with, you know, some of the worst groups that we're most worried about. And the the concern there is obviously that these guys are going there picking up skills, picking up connections with other extremist organisations, and what happens when they come back. So that that is one thing that's you know, drag them back um, to the region. In terms of the Security Council, I, I have to say that, um, you know, obviously it's, something, it's, a, it's a seat they inherited, right? It was, a, it was a, a right initiative. But neither the previous government nor this government have really used, I think, our time on the Security Council well enough. I mean, you can have a debate about whether we should have invested so much money in, to, to, to take this seat and what does it mean and what influence can we have? But I think it's, it's an indictment of both governments that neither have really said, well, OK, what's our agenda here? What can we actually achieve and really use that, that time on what is, you know, one of the world's key, not decision-making body, but a, but a key kind of political forum? And, and that's, no, um, that's no slight against our diplomats in the UN, many of whom I know personally and who, who are great and have made most of the opportunity. But what's been disappointing has been the lack of a larger vision. Now, to some degree, you can understand from this government because they, they said, well, we shouldn't have uh, looked for a seat anyway. But what's less, uh, what's more difficult to understand is, is the previous government, which did want to, uh, which did seek a seat and which really hasn't used, haven't used that opportunity uh, well enough. How should they have used it, for example? <clears throat> Look, there are a couple of things, there are a couple of ways you can use it. One is, I think it would, it, um, they should have defined a big international issue um, that they use the Security Council as a platform for. Now, it doesn't really matter, um, in, in some senses, what they, that issue is. Now, obviously, it should be an issue that matters to Australia. And you want to show, it should be an issue that goes beyond your immediate kind of, you know, region. So it might be, you know, in the same way that in, in, in previous eras we made um, a big push internationally on chemical weapons. Um, we were making our contribution um, to, to global security. We, we, and, and it reflects on us as a country because it says that we have ideas about how the world works. We're not just concerned with our narrow patch and our narrow neighbourhood and we're not pulling to our shell. So that's one way. The other way is that the Security Council get, brings you into close contact with, um, the, you know, with other countries and the world, world's great powers with the, with the permanent member of the Security Council. And that's an opportunity to build new relationships and new partnerships through that interaction on key global issues that come before the Security Council. And I think we've done that to a certain degree, but I, I don't think we've done that well enough. It's interesting that we can have, have been talking for half an hour already and the United States hasn't been mentioned, uh, but I am about to mention it. Oh, Rory, you go, go ahead. I, I was going to say... I we, we, we're sort of... A, it's behind every sentence. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like the, the, the invisible dot yeah. US that's yeah. missing from... Yeah. Um, the pivot to Asia, which, of course, uh, got a real boost when President Obama yeah. gave it one in our federal parliament a few mm. years ago. Where is that right now? Where, where are yeah. we at with well, the pivot to Asia? Yeah. That's a critical <laughs> question. I mean, going back to the the strategic issues in Asia and ultimately globally, um, that, is, uh, that is one of the fundamental questions. And we have to say that uh, the, for a long time I've said the jury is out on the pivot. I've been, I guess, charitable. Um, I think we are moving in the next few months to a stage where the United States really has to send a much clearer signal about its seriousness. Um, Obama is actually due to visit Asia in April, uh, Japan, South Korea, China. If he 
doesn't send uh, very tangible signals during that visit about um, not only US diplomatic attention to the region, but also the shifting of US, uh, I guess, strategic focus, even military resources to the region, then I do think we're going to see increasing nervousness from countries like Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, that have very much sheltered under uh, the American security umbrella over the years. I think it's, in a way, it's a problem of America's own making because, in fact, um, even as we see China rising and we see uh, a relative decline in American power and influence, America is still hugely invested in Asia, whether it's financially, whether it's militarily, whether it's diplomatically. They've somehow not managed to emphasise the degree of their existing investment and instead there's been this hint that they're going to deliver more and, that's, and the fact that they haven't has then left a lot of the region scratching its head, uh, nervous, and it's also that I think um, senior American really diplomatic leaders and officials and, and, and voices uh, haven't been as present in the region as they were a couple of years ago when Hillary Clinton and Kurt Campbell were driving the rebalance. And finally, Russia, Ukraine, Crimea, just when we thought there were two areas of American strategic focus in the world, Middle East and uh, East Asia or the Indo-Pacific, suddenly there are three. So... Uh, the next few months will be crucial, and I, I, I wouldn't say with absolute certainty that America will convince its allies that the rebalance uh, remains real. Uh, it's really about leadership from here on. So where does Australia sit in that uncertainty? Well, look, Australia, uh, it's no secret that um, really both sides, or both the major parties in Australian politics are very supportive of the US alliance and of the US role in the region. Uh, our opinion polling shows a very high proportion of the Australian population wants the alliance with the United States, sees it as in Australia's interests. Uh, but having said that, as America reduces its own defence spending and focuses on problems at home, of which it has, it has many, there is going to be a growing expectation on allies and partners to do more in the region. And I think the jury is also out on whether Australia is going to step up to that role. And what can we do as an ally that is not essentially about um, simply diplomatic support or providing strategic real estate for that matter? Can we help to shape America's strategy in Asia in, in stabilising ways? That's, that's the big question. Roy makes a really important point here, and I think it's often lost on the, kind of the broader audience. I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, the, the, the international policy called Nascenti kind of talk about, but it's something that I don't think the broader community realise, that we are really at a transformative moment. I mean, this is not just kind of business as usual. Um, Australia used to be distant from the great kind of centres of global competition. We are now right in the middle of it. And we're in the middle of it at a time when the person, the, the, the country that, that um, we look to for cover um, is still going to be a great power, but it's going to be a declining one. And that's going to mean that we're going to have to do things like Rory said. Is It's going to mean big questions about how much we spend on defence, how big we are as a country, how, um, how much we invest in our in our diplomacy and no longer is it like it's not a kind of a wonkish kind of question anymore this goes to goes to in the way we live we live our lives simply because it used to be you know we could in the 20th century we could sit back and watch you know the, the cold war play out in europe from a distance we could watch conflicts play out in the middle east from a distance and choose you know the extent to which we became involved we're not going to have that choice anymore because it's now right in our front yard mm. And as Rory says, with all these unexpected turbulence going on as well. Yeah, I mean, just just to go to that point, uh, Sally, I think it's you know this is not a simple China is rising, America is declining, therefore we have to make major changes. It's it's actually more more confusing than that, and that is that uh, even if, for example, uh, America manages to. Uh, to, 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 to stop or manage its own relative decline. It will stay an enormously powerful and influential country. China is, frankly, deeply uncertain about its own future. We should not assume that China will be a, uh, a smoothly rising, wealthy, stable country. It's doing wonderfully by certain indicators at the moment, but this is a country where uh, the elite uh, educate their children abroad, the elite send their money abroad. They're not necessarily all that confident in their own future 
and other countries in the region will react to China's rise, whether China's rise is, is happy and, um, and prosperous or whether, whether China's rise takes uh, a darker path. And that's what we have to watch for. It could be Japan, it could be another country in the region that reacts in its own destabilising way. So I think whatever happens, we have to essentially uh, prepare our own house, prepare Australia to be a strong actor in this region. And this is a country, unfortunately or fortunately, where our interests are much greater than our own ability to advance them. Mm. Well, great. <laughs> <laughs> You have some good news, so right? Mm. <laughs> Please. Well, unlike, for example, I don't know, Belgium. Well, or in 1914, it wasn't very good at protecting its own interests. Oh, better than 1914. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's uh, talk a bit about the um, defence spending and where that fits with our policy, with our needs and our ambitions. Um, Jenny, perhaps in, in the close region yes. first. Well, previous white paper, and Rory will remind me that there's another one coming up, so I shouldn't depend on that, but the existing white paper um, that was drafted by the, the, Rad, sorry, the Gillard government um, names uh, stabilising and securing the South Pacific and, and uh, East Timor as our second highest priority. So I think we can draw from that the, that the ADF is very focused on the region. I think as we've seen the drawdown from Anthony's part of the world, from the Middle East, they're certainly focusing um, back closer to home. Um, and I think that's where certainly the, the government has, has said its interests are. It's talked all about, it's all about the Asia-Pacific. That's where we're focusing all of our economic assets, our political assets, the, the term that Bishop frequently uses. Um, so I think that's certainly going to drive uh, thinking about defence policy with this government. But I think the big problem that they'll face is uh, where they're going to draw the extra money from um, and where they're going to, to fund these these ambitions and, and even fund their, their ongoing um, Needs which have nothing to do with extending their ambitions. I might turn to Rory for that. Well, I'll stay with the Pacific for a moment and then we'll sort of take the global view with Anthony again, I guess. But um, the, I think when you look at the tasks or the expectations of the Australian Defence Force over the past 10 to 15 years, it's very easy to speculate about all sorts of global challenges that we've got to assist in meeting. We've got to help manage global order. We're contributing to coalitions led by America or under a UN flag, however it may be. But actually, the biggest expectation on Australia as a strategic and a military actor is in our neighbourhood. And it is in the South Pacific, it is in PNG, East Timor, all of these places. I think, in a sense, uh, if I were to say where will we see Australia um, be expected to intervene at some point in the near future, it will be somewhere where we've been before. And I don't know which one of those places it will be, but it's more likely to be somewhere we've been before than somewhere entirely new. I think going to your bigger question about um, where does defence policy fit in all of this, a lot of countries in the world need to get their own houses in order and ha need to get uh, defence policy in order in a time when, frankly, budgets are either declining or not going to get all that much bigger. Now, this government has set a kind of iconic standard of, I think, 2% of GDP for defence spending. In the last uh, federal election, in fact, both sides uh, sort of focused on that number. Now, of course, we don't know in 10 years from now exactly what 2% will buy. And it may not be enough or it may be too much. We just don't know. But I think um, that was, a, uh, I think, quite a, a sensible rhetorical target because uh, we're spending a lot less than that at the moment. Um, a lot of countries in the region are spending a lot more. We're not talking about an outlandish figure. It's not a wartime figure. It's just, a, I think, a fairly uh, a more robust figure than we've got at the moment and it would give Australia potentially the ability to have some greater strategic influence in the region to, for example, have more to contribute maybe to the US alliance or maybe to partnerships with other countries. If we're going to rebuild relations with Indonesia, for example, it would be nice to sort of rebuild some of the security partnership that we've had with Indonesia in the past in areas like humanitarian assistance, counterterrorism, and so on. If we're going to manage relations with China, uh, well, we don't just see China as uh, a great source of uncertainty. If it's about delivering public goods in the region, uh, again, disaster relief or counter piracy or whatever it might be, 
China's also going to be a, a partner. It's interesting that this search and rescue mission in the South China Sea right now mm. deeply involves China in, thankfully, a cooperative way, unlike the more confrontational way we've seen in the past. Now, there's another whole debate to be had about whether uh, government money is better spent on, on guns or butter or education or whatever else it may be. But certainly, if we're going to claim to be uh, the kind of effective middle power uh, that we see ourselves as, then we're going to have to spend, I think, more on defence, or we have to think of ourselves as, frankly, a different kind of country and start saying to the South Pacific, sorry, guys, look somewhere else when you need help. And I don't think, as a society, uh, we're ready to do that. Anthony. I mean, Roy's right to emphasise the defence dimension, but there are other dimensions of it. Yeah, I mean, agreed. there is a there is a, a, a broad um, range of tools that all countries use um, to influence uh, international affairs. And I think one of the things, one of the problematic things over the last decade is we've focused too much on the military tools and the intelligence tools, and not enough on you know old-fashioned diplomacy. Um, and there's a whole question about aid, which Jenny's yeah. a lot more qualified to answer than I am. But I, I think, I think, you know, <laughs> alongside this whole question of what we spend on defence, we have to start thinking a bit more um, creatively, um, but a bit more deeply about what are the other ways that we can shape the world around us. Because it's not enough to simply say anymore, well, we're a big country, we're far from everywhere. You know, who cares what happens outside our shores? Things happen in this interconnected world that deeply influence people's lo daily lives, right? It's not just... This is not something that you watch on TV at night, right? So, so you have to think about what can we as a country that is resource-constrained, that doesn't have a huge population, that doesn't have a huge budget, what, how can we best use all the different tools we have to try and shape the environment? And I think old-style diplomacy, having a network of of diplomats, using other kind of uh, other mechanisms, using the Australian diaspora, whatever it is, to try and both understand the world and shape the world beyond our shores. I just hear this again and again and again, whether it's uh, whatever level of international relations, it's about people, it's about speaking the language, it's about mm. knowing the culture. Um, and uh, in fact, it was we, we discussed that at length last year. Is there any sign of improvement on that front anywhere? There's there's some, I guess, positive rhetorical directions, but there's actually a fundamental change taking place, which I think, I mean, Jenny, you might want to talk about, or others of us can talk about, which is the, uh, frankly, the uh, the end of Australia's aid agency, the abolition of AusAid and its amalgamation with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Now, uh, the one side of that is uh, to say this is, um, this is uh, you know, a, um, frankly, an insult to uh, Australia as, a, as an aid provider. This is a bad, a bad move, a retrograde step. The other side is to say, well, in fact, Development assistance aid has always, has always really been a diplomatic tool, so why not uh, do it properly, do it efficiently and, and make it part of the day-to-day -day work of our diplomats? Now, this is very much a work in progress. I think it's a lot of eggs are going to be broken, and I don't know whether we'll end up with an omelette or something um, a lot less pleasant, but, uh, Jenny, you might have a greater insight. It's a lot of mixing of Hessian bags and Gucci bags <laughs> and the deep fat foil. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, going to be, it's going to be a very tough sort of cultural challenge among two very different bureaucracies. But and Jenny, it has been a, a, an obvious not, shift, not as obvious perhaps as Joe Hockey's end of entitlement, <laughs> but there's a, part of that seems to actually be in these changes and particularly in our region. Yeah, well, it, it certainly I mean, it startled a lot of people, the, the announcement to merge the departments and, and, more importantly, bring aid under more closely under the umbrella of foreign policy. I mean, as Roy says, it's always been a, a tool of foreign policy and it's always been a part, um, really, of DFAT's overall agenda, um, using aid as, as a tool. But uh, certainly this government's been very much more direct about it than, than any previous government has been, and now aid certainly will be used by, by diplomats themselves rather than by diplomats asking aid officials to, to help out. But I, I think we should look at the positives that um, the government is talking about uh, amassing and uh, uniting and cooperating with all its, all its assets, um, which I think will include defence, of course, as it has in the past, um, hopefully intelligence, foreign policy, trade policy, um, using aid um, under that umbrella as well. So I think we're, we're seeing kind of a, perhaps not a narrowing, but a, a, 
I guess, a, a convergence um, of all our different activities to try and focus on what's, what really matters to us in the region. Of course, our reaction to China is going to play a big part of that, um, but also trying to, to work out where, where we can make a difference um, in our new region and, and you know, where our, our limits are and, and what we can do best. Um, so I think that's what the government is intending to, to try and bring aid to back to not necessarily being more effective. I think it already is pretty effective, but, but making, making it enhance the, the other aspects of Australian policy. Um, if you would like to ask a question, put your hand up and someone will put a microphone in it. And um, here we are. Jenny, thank you for those comments. You talked about Julie Bishop's commitment and engagement with the Pacific. I'd like to pose to you that every other member of Cabinet is undercutting that. Um, Greg Hunt didn't go to the climate negotiations, something that no one's mentioned, but we're supposed to be signing a global treaty next year. Um, Australia cut all funding for the Green Climate Fund when they went to the Commonwealth meeting in November last year. Um, Tony Abbott announced that there would be no funding for the Green Climate Fund, and yet we were on the board of the thing. Um, uh, Julie Bishop in January announced $650 million cuts to the aid program in the next six months. And while trade with China and Asia and so on may be a big thing, for small island states in our region, they're reliant on aid, they're not going to get benefits from trade and so on. Scott Morrison's just given $1.2 billion to Transfield over the next four years to run Manus and Nauru. And so countries that are getting cuts to their climate funding, to their aid funding and so on, are looking at why are we giving $1.2 billion to an Australian corporation okay, to run the refugee things? Okay, you've got a, a question. So the question is, with a treaty to be signed on climate next year, with replacement for the Millennium Development Goals, isn't Australia going into the chamber naked with nothing to put on the table to help negotiate these global processes? Thanks, Nick. I should disclose that Nick and I are friends, and uh, that's definitely not a Dorothy Dix, I think. <laughs> no. uh, I think you're right. I think other elements of the Australian Cabinet are probably undermining Julie Bishop. Um, you know, she's going great guns on her you know, expanding relations with the region and making friends with uh, governments in Papua New Guinea and Fiji, but she's not really supported by the likes of our immigration uh, policy, I guess, um, and she hasn't really succeeded yet in doing the things that she's talked about, mobilising our economic assets, um, in mobilising our aid um, for the best effect in the region, and indeed we have seen cuts. And certainly our environment policy is definitely at odds with the priorities of Pacific Island countries, who's, many of whom are, are facing sea level rise and whose main priority is addressing climate change. So I think We'll probably see that uh, come more to the fore during the Pacific Islands Forum meeting, which is taking place in July this year, when Tony Abbott will have to go and front the region um, for the first time and, and hopefully understand uh, what their priorities are. And uh, hopefully we'll see a bit more policy direction uh, in, in the climate area. But yeah, I, I do share your pessimism about that at the moment. Shane, uh, question to Rory. Uh, Russia and Japan sorted out their three island issue mutually without third party interference. Uh, Japan and Burma in the past have sorted out their border disputes without third party interference. Why both are uh, Japan and uh, China are economically dependent heavily on each other. Why should we take side and not them allow to sort out their issue themselves rather than mudding our hands in a, in a uh, flowing river, which we don't know where it will end. So why don't we just allow them to sort out their own difference on the border peacefully and mutually, and then stay out of it, basically? That's my question. It's a good question. That's no, a great question. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with your reading of the Russia-Japan relationship, because I think although they're managing their differences, um, they still dispute, uh, dispute um, boundaries. They're, they still, there are still many incursions by Russian aircraft into Japanese, what the Japanese claim is their airspace. So there's, there's a, a sleeping issue there as well, but they are being pragmatic about it. Uh, they are letting trade uh, and other things dominate their relationship. So you're right that they're, they're managing that. China, Japan, um, I see it as, I ultimately see it ultimately as a bigger issue than China, Japan. I don't think we should take sides, and uh, I think, the, the, I guess, in fairness to the government, I don't think 
it sees itself as taking sides either. We're certainly not endorsing, um, for example, Japan's territorial claim over China's or indeed anyone else's. I mean, whether it's India and China, whether it's the other countries in Southeast Asia and China, uh, we're not taking sides on the claims. What we should be doing, and I'm not sure the government has always articulated this, uh, I guess, uh, cleanly or, or, or accurately, is that we should be standing up for certain principles, such as um, the, the non-use of force, uh, no coercion and so forth, and frankly, a, um, uh, a fair rendering of history as well. I think one weakness that both China and Japan have, and it's not only Japan, is the way they deliberately interpret and present their history and the history of these disputes. But we can't stay out. We can't simply say this has nothing to do with us because the risks in the, the China-Japan essentially confrontation at the moment over the, uh, the islands in the East China Sea are such that uh, you could see uh, escalation to to conflict. It's only a small possibility. They would try and manage it politically. They have deep economic ties. But China is using risk as a strategy, and the Japanese, I think, military is beginning to, uh, to respond, to take China seriously. If other countries in the region stay out and say China and J Japan can resolve this themselves, um, I think it would be uh, actually much more risky for the region than if we tried to essentially mobilise interests to support a, a, a rules-based outcome. So, sorry, and, to, and even to beg these countries to communicate with one another. The very fact that there are no operational hotlines between the Chinese and Japanese forces in the East China Sea is surely something that we all have an interest in. Um, hi. Um, really appreciate Sally mentioning the US. Um, it wasn't spoken about that much tonight. Um, so one of my questions, actually one question and kind of a comment at the same time um, to Anthony. Um, you use the words Islamist and jihadist to describe the Muslim Brotherhood and I'd like to know what you mean in this context, what these terms mean. Um, these get thrown around quite a lot when you talk about the Middle East and I'm sure you know and it's difficult to compound really complex issues in you know a very short talk. Um, but yeah, the Muslim Brotherhood didn't necessarily speak for many Muslim people and a lot of leftist and a lot of grassroots, um, not necessarily even Muslim, but just Egyptian, uh, Coptic Christian Egyptians um, who were out on the front lines fighting basically to end the clutches of America um, of, onto Egypt. So I'd just like to, for you to kind of clarify why you use the term Islamist and jihadist in this context. Sure. Um, so an Islamist, um, and, and the term Islamist is older than the term jihadist in, in, in the kind of the modern sense that we've been using it. So an Islamist is simply someone that, that uses Islam as a political ideology. And the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, established in 1927, 28 in Egypt, is a kind of classical Islamist organisation in the sense that, that what they are aiming for is the creation of an Islamic state. And they're a political movement. The term jihadist is something that has been used much more frequently in the last 10 years, and that refers to those, whether they're Islamists or those activists, that focus narrowly on the violent end of the activist spectrum, that are focused on um, acts of violence, acts of terror, whether it's in the cause of overthrowing the regime um, of the country that they live in or whether it's targeting the US. So in my own mind, there's very much a distinction between the two. I mean, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood has, has had violent periods in its history. Um, it has had uh, there, it, there are violent, violent elements that have moved out of uh, emerged out of the movement, but in Egypt at least, it's basically been a political but also social, religious, and broader movement. Jihadists are much more narrowly focused on participating in violent struggle, whether it's internal or external. So I, I hope that clarifies things. Um, you make a very good point. The Egyptian uprising in 2011 was not an Islamist uh, uprising. Uh, in many ways, the way I see it, it was an uprising of the younger generation um, who were essentially, and you know, some who were Islamists, some who were secular, some who described themselves as liberals. But basically what they were doing was throwing off the, trying to throw off the dead weight of a system that was limiting their potential. Uh, and in, you know, in many different ways, professionally, politically, um, economically. Um, and the problem was that 
um, whilst they coalesced around this idea that we have to change the system, we have to revolutionise Egypt, what they didn't, weren't able to do after the uprising was coalesce around a plan of, of how we build a new system. And what that meant was that the traditional opposition movements, like the Muslim Brotherhood, who were organised, who did have an idea, were able to capitalise it, and, and they won parliamentary and, and um and the presidential election after it. Where I disagree with you is that this was about the US. And what was really interesting was um, in the early uh, days of the uprising um, uh, uh, and in the protests, there was a very distinct part of the protests which, which was, you know, and you saw this in placards directed uh, uh, at, at kind of Western TV cameras, which, this is not about you guys, this is about us. It's not about US domination over our country, although that's something we've been concerned about. It's basically about the system, the Egyptian system that we're, that we're trying to deal with. It's not about Israel-Palestine. It's not about US democratization or US dominance of the region. It's about us changing our destiny. And you know what? Even if you have the best intentions in the world, we want you to stay out. And amongst, you know, I lived in Egypt in the early 90s. I go back regularly. Uh, many kind of close friendships that I maintain, and that's that, a really strong sentiment that we underestimate. That in the end, they don't want it to be portrayed in, in you know, some kind of you know colonial or, or, or old school terms. They want it to be about them. Uh, and even as a as a you know as a Westerner, as someone who wants to see, who wanted to see the uprising succeed, they would say. We like your sentiment, but stay out. This is for us um, to determine. And it's something I think we, we, we should respect. Except that it won't be that way if things go the way you think they That's might. Right. It'll be up to us. Well, we're going to have, we're going to, do, we're going to, have to deal with um, the problem. And unfortunately, the promise of the uprising in 2011 hasn't been fulfilled. Um, so what's happened is that the, the energy and the commitment of young people to a large degree, has petered out. And it's petered out because they've been caught between the Brotherhood on the one hand and the military on the other hand, and they've been squeezed out by this conflict um, between these two large groups. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago in Egypt, talking to young activists, people were talking about returning to professional lives, being very disillusioned with politics, and that's the positive side of the story. The negative side of the story is that, you know, there are young people that are being radicalised by this process who are saying, well... You know, we came to this uprising with a very non-violent agenda, and maybe we were wrong. Maybe we should have come instead of in, instead of coming with with placards and, and ideas. We should have come with stones and guns. Mm. One more uh, question for Rory. Rory, I assume that in the last six months we've been deliberately sending a message to Indonesia. With your insight, what is that message? <laughs> 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 Just one? <laughs> Look, um, and I, I should, as Sally knows, I'm, I'm not an Indonesia expert. In fact, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised we haven't talked about India, oh, which I've is the country I usually like to talk myself, about. Rory, but I have. I'm actually I'm going to Jakarta next week, and it will be very interesting um, to, to find out what that message is. I'll actually be at a defence dialogue next week where our defence minister will be giving the first speech by an Australian minister mm -hmm. since all the trouble started, uh, well, the latest trouble started with Indonesia. Look, I think that behind the scenes there's, there's a pretty serious effort to get back to, frankly, just a, a working relationship with Indonesia. That's all we need, all we want at the moment. I don't think anyone in Canberra has grand plans for that relationship. We're waiting for a start uh, for, the, um, for the elections in Indonesia this year to find out what the new government, the new leadership will, will look like. And as I said, I don't think we're going to do better than SB, SBY, which is a big, a big tragedy in a way that, um, that, that, that rightly or wrongly uh, there's, there's been a, um, you know, a terrible upset between Australia and the, uh, the Indonesian president that was frankly the best friend we could have had in Indonesia at this time. I think, though, that that in the long run there'll be there'll be an attempt to build to focus on um, the broader understandings with Indonesia, the societal links, the business links, and so forth, which are frankly quite thin. I mean, we we need to um, 
to really invest a lot more in that relationship. Uh, it's extraordinary how little depth there is to that relationship, really, um, you know, despite all the people that go to Bali and some of whom realise it is actually part of... Uh, of Indonesia, uh, <laughs> you know. So, um, so look, I, I don't think that there's uh, there's a hell of a lot of hope for a transformation of the relationship. The best we can do is muddle through this year and hope that we can establish a greater degree of trust with the next Indonesian government. But I I think this is always going to be uh, a pretty average relationship, a, a very pragmatic relationship. I don't think it's going to be anything like the the great alliance that some uh, commentators uh, anticipate. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you for your questions and apologies if you didn't get to ask a question. If you, if you, you can go and chat while they're signing copies of the, the book uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, you used the word muddle then mm. in the last sentence or so. And it, the, the world is feeling mighty muddled to me at the moment um, and not that great, uh, but you have brought clarity, uh, the three so. of you this <laughs> evening. Uh, not a great deal of reassurance, uh, some, but uh, clarity and we really, really appreciate it. I hope you'll come back next year. Uh, thank you very much to the Lowy Centre for uh, lending us three all at once. It's like an heir and a spare and, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and someone else. else. And uh, it's been really, really enjoyable. Please thank Rory Metcalf, Jenny Hayward-Jones and Anthony Bubalo. And um, for any of you that may not know, the Lowy Institute is an independent, non-partisan international policy think tank. They're based in Sydney. They love coming to Melbourne. And uh, their research and analysis is very accessible. Um, you just go to their web and have a roam. If you haven't had a look at it, um, go and have a look. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And have a really safe and enjoyable night. Thank you. Thank you.